All righty, we are back here at All Prophecy Fulfilled. Thank you for joining me in my quest to define the last days biblically. Uh, we are in Daniel chapter 12, as you know, and last lesson we covered uh, only verse one. And we did that by breaking it down into six different phrases. And again, before we did that, I made it abundantly clear that the time frame uh, that chapter 11 had brought us to was the days of the early Roman Empire uh, when they were the dominant world power to the days approaching Messiah. Okay, and that right there is where we were in Daniel 12, verse one. And what did we have in verse 1? Well, we had a time of trouble. It was Jacob's time of trouble, uh, otherwise described as the great tribulation by Jesus himself. And that is when he foretold those events that would transpire in his generation. The great tribulation in verse 1, as biblically defined, took place in the first century. Now, I left you with something to consider uh, as we approach verse 2. Is there anything that contextually separates verse 1 from verse 2? Now, remember what I said in the last video. If we're going to place anything, and I mean anything that we see in Daniel chapter 12, outside uh, this first century time frame, we're going to have to provide some solid exegetical proof that compels us to do so. Uh, you see, the natural reading from verse 1 to 2 is that they are contextually connected. It seems rather obvious to say that. Verse 1 is naturally connected to verse 2 because verse 2 naturally flows from verse 1. So then, both verses occur within very close proximity to each other because they're both tethered to the phrase, at that time. Okay, and that comes, that's in verse 1, as we covered last time. So that time is the same for each verse. There's absolutely no reason to disconnect them. So why the fuss? Why am I going on and on and on ad nauseum about this? Well, because at that time, what do we have in verse 2? Well, let me show you. Let me read verse 1 and 2 together. Chapter 12, 1 and 2. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, if you are just a wee bit familiar with your Bible, you know what this is, don't you? Come on, admit it. Say it. This is resurrection. You probably recognize the language from the New Testament because Jesus says uh, some things that are very similar sounding, like in John chapter 5, for example, and we're going to get to that. So, we have a great tribulation in verse 1, followed by a resurrection in verse 2. Two. Now, is there any way to dichotomize these two events into separate time periods? No, they're inseparably linked together. In fact, all the prophets uh, made this very same connection, and I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Uh, the resurrection would come at the end of the tribulation. The tribulation and the resurrection, they're really just kind of two sides of the same coin. So if you have one, well, you're going to have the other. That's the way it works. The prophets placed the tribulation in the last days of Israel, followed by the resurrection of the dead, which was likewise in close proximity to what? The destruction of the temple. So look, I get it. If you have uh, this notion uh, of, you know, physical bodies coming out of the graves in our future, you know, if that's been ingrained in that noggin of yours, um, then that's really hard to let go. In fact, you know, it's hard to even consider anything else. But you know what? That's not what Daniel 
or the, the Old Testament prophets taught. And you know what? That's not what the New Testament writers taught. And that's not what Jesus taught. Uh, there was not some, some new teaching, you know, or new notion of resurrection taught in the New Testament. No. Paul and the apostles, they taught nothing but what the Old Testament prophets taught taught. That's just the way it is. And that includes their teaching on resurrection. Now, the difference is they, the New Testament writers and the New Testament prophets, they were living in that final generation uh, that saw the fulfillment of what those Old Testament prophets taught. Okay, so, so we can't just jump right smack dab into the beginning of the New Testament and just kind of assume we know what resurrection means. And you know what? I think that so many of us do that uh, because we open up our New Testaments you know, and we do see physical resurrections within the New Testament story. And I think we just assume that this is kind of a one size fits all uh, universal meaning of resurrection. And, you know, this kind of resurrection, you know, of everyone who ever lived, uh, that hasn't happened yet. So the resurrection hasn't happened. Case closed. No, no, not so fast. Just just hold your horses here. Let me get, grab a sip here. If we're going to be responsible Bible students, and I think we are, right? We must allow the prophets to define resurrection for us. So that when we do approach or we do come to the New Testament, uh, we are familiar with resurrection language. We must stand on the authority of the prophets. Now, the, the actual word resurrection, that's not actually found uh, in all of the Old Testament. But the idea is, the teaching is, the concept is. Uh, and the idea, I think, is sometimes conveyed with, with terms like uh, being raised or, or raising up or arising from sleep or awakening, something like that. These phrases were used by the prophets uh, uh, to convey resurrection concepts. Uh, and, and this is something so important to understand. Um, and I think many simply just don't really think about these things. There's more than one kind or one meaning of resurrection developed in the Old Testament. Resurrection really is an Old Testament prophetic last days theme. And you know what? It's a multifaceted theme. It's not necessarily difficult, I don't believe, so much as it's a concept with different layers of meaning that the prophets develop over time. So let me explain this, if you will. In the Bible, do we ever see, here's a question for you, do we ever see resurrection or a resurrection, meaning a physically dead person uh, is, you know, coming back to life, a breath coming into them, into their physical body? Yeah, sure we do. Uh, we see that in the Old Testament. You got, you know, the days of Elijah and Elijah, they raised the dead. Uh, in the New Testament, obviously, we have a few raised by Jesus. You have the little girl, you have uh, the son of Jairus, you've got uh, Lazarus, of course, and don't forget, you know, the granddaddy of them all, Jesus. I think even in Acts, you've got a, some raised by the apostles. So yes, of course, we do see that. Um, this is physical resurrection, and we see see that in the Bible. But is that the only type or is that the only concept of resurrection taught in Scripture? Well, no, not even close. So I understand the knee-jerk I think tendency to simply read Dan, you know, Daniel 12 and simply think that Daniel 12's resurrection is just that. It's dead physical corpses, you know, uh, coming out of the graves. But I think we need to reserve judgment uh, on that. <clears throat> Uh, for now, and I think we need to look at various resurrection concepts taught in Scripture. So I'm going to explain to you four different resurrection concepts, and they're all kind of related to each, each other, but they have their own nuances and their own implications. So concept number one, resurrection concept number one, 
Yes, we see physical resurrection in scripture. We see occurrences of individuals, uh, physical dead bodies being raised up. Now, what was the purpose of these resurrections? Well, these resurrections really served as signs. They pointed to the, you know, the reality of Christ's deity. Uh, they pointed to uh, the demonstrable power of the only God who could raise the dead. Um, but what about the resurrection of Jesus himself? Well, Matthew 12, 38 through 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered them, saying, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How about Luke 1130? For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. So yes, the physical resurrection of Jesus was a sign as well. Folks, signs point to things. Signs uh, point towards, you know, greater reality, greater truths. truths. Um, so what was the resurrection of Jesus actually pointing to? What was it indicating? Well, you know what? We know that Jesus himself was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was the beginning of a coming alive, if you will. But there was an order to this resurrection. There was an order to the, this being raised up. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 tells us that uh, each one in his own... Now, this is the great re, you know, resurrection passage, 1 Corinthians 15. But each one in his own order. And he's speaking of resurrection here. Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming. Now, when we study out, or if we were to study out the concept of first fruits, we know that his resurrection was only the beginning of a process. And that process would not take 3,000 years to complete. We're not waiting for that process to complete. Once the first fruits were gathered, the rest was soon to be soon to be. The last day's process of resurrection, beginning with his resurrection, came to the completion at the end of that age when the wheat was gathered into the barn and the tares were burned up. And that happened in AD 70. So what was the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus pointing to? What was it indicating? Well, it, the harvest season had begun. Uh, the resurrection had begun. That's what. Resurrection concept number two. Now, I'm tempted to say spiritual resurrection, but you know what? I'll get about 50 comments screaming, hey, man, you just spiritualize everything. You can't do that. Okay, so I'm going to use the term covenantal resurrection, covenantal resurrection. Now, check this out. Listen to how Paul describes uh, what is happening to living, breathing, physically alive people in his day. Ephesians 2, verse 5, even when we were dead in trespass, God, or he, even when we were dead in trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And listen to this, and raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How about Colossians 3, 1, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. How about Colossians 2, 12 and 13? Buried with him in bap baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him up from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespass. Folks, this is 
resurrection. And I know this might go against what most of you have in your mind when you think resurrection. But there was a re there was a resurrection going on during this first generation. We have to recognize that. And no, of course, it was not a physical one. So here's what's kind of going on here. Individuals during this transition period were coming out of the body of Moses and they were being born again into the new covenant body of Christ. These individuals, I think they could have been uh, either Jews of the Southern Kingdom, Israelites of the Northern Kingdom who had been scattered. Verses like these, they demonstrate how People were covenantly, covenantally dead to God at one time, but they were made alive in Christ, uh, raised up into the covenant that brought life. The covenant defined death, therefore the covenant defined life, resurrection life. Now check this out. Speaking to those very same Ephesians, Paul says this, Ephesians 5, 14, Therefore he says, Awake! You who sleep, arise from the dead. So they're sleeping. They need to awake. They need to arise from the dead. And Christ will give you life. That's resurrection language, my friend. So here, Paul writing to living, breathing, physically living people. And he's telling them to awake, rise from the dead, get out of the dust. But this, my friends, is critical. This is absolutely critical. Do you know where Paul is pulling this from? This is a clear reference to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19 right smack dab in the middle of Isaiah's little apocalypse, a last day passage. Isaiah says this, your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing you who dwell in the dust for your dew is like the dew of herbs and the earth or the land shall cast out the dead. Now, wait a minute. You got the dead shall live. You got people arising, awakening. You got dwelling in the dust. This is the same language that Daniel uses here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Or how about this? I can throw a lot of these out. I'll just throw one more. Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise. You have to understand this. When passages like this, uh, Isaiah 52, uh, Isaiah 26, when these are used by Paul, he was bringing the context of those Old Testament verse passages into his writing to support what he was saying to the Ephesians, to the Corinthians, uh, to the Colossians, etc. He, uh, what was foretold by Isaiah was relevant because it was coming into fruition. That's why. And that's why Paul quoted it. So you, sometimes you just got to roll up your sleeves a little bit. You got to get into these Old Testament passages and you need to figure out what the context is of these Old Testament passages. And if you do, here's what you're going to find. Uh, when, according to Isaiah 26, uh, would the resurrection occur? Or according to Isaiah 24, 25, 26, 27, Isaiah's little apocalypse, when would it occur? Well, when would these dead actually awake out of the dust? And to what would it be contextually connected to? Well, it would be in that day. It'd be in the day when Leviathan, the, the serpent, was punished. It would be in the day the stones of the altar would be made like chalk stones beaten to dust. That's 87. It would be in the day when the remnant would be gathered. That's what we, what we see happening in the New Testament. It would be in the day of the wedding feast, that AD 70. It would be in the day that iniquity uh, was covered and sin was taken away. And yes, it would be in the day the city, Jerusalem, would be made a desolation and a ruin in judgment. That's when all these things are first century events. And they're all tied to resurrection. You got to understand that. So you see, Paul didn't just make up this new theology or some concept of resurrection on his own. It came from the prophets. Paul was applying Isaiah's passage 
to the Ephesians in their day. There was a resurrection occurring in the last days. Those dead to God uh, were believing in him, awakening to God, ultimately coming into covenant with him through faith. John 5, 25, most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. The hour is coming and now is. Individuals were being resurrected, made alive in Christ. So we've got individual physical resurrection. We've got individual covenant covenantal resurrection. And we've got number three, we need to understand that the Old Testament prophets, thus Paul and the New Testament writers, viewed resurrection uh, in another sense, in addition to what I've mentioned. Uh, the prophets spoke of, and they viewed God's people as a whole, as a collective body or yeah collective body that's so that's resurrection concept number three and this really isn't that foreign to us i mean we refer, refer to the universal church you know as the body of christ so then when you know when when the people uh rose up to play, if you will, and they worshiped idols and throughout their long history, they continually transgressed the covenant. Uh, there were covenant consequences for the people as a whole, for the group, just as there were covenant blessings for the people as a whole that came with obedience. OK, so you might recall Deuteronomy chapter 30, for example, they were given the option, the choice to choose obedience in life or disobedience and death. Far too often they chose the latter and they experienced death. But this promise applied to both individuals and to the, the corporate body at large, the people collectively. So then, if we pay attention to the story, we can see these, these waves of a kind of a collective dying and a collective rising as a people. In fact, it becomes thematic. It's thematic. You've got the obvious examples of the Assyrian and the Babylonian um, uh, conquests. Uh, I, you know, I think of the book of Judges. That comes to mind as far as Israel's kind of cyclical pattern of disobedience, covenant consequences, you know, of, of death outside their land, and then crying out to God, then restoration, life back in the land. These are kind of mini pictures uh, of resurrection, so to speak. Uh, and I think that I, I think we see a glimpse of this collective rising uh, in what we just read here in Isaiah chapter 26, 19. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. And actually, together with isn't actually in the text. So it could read more literally uh, your dead body. Uh, your dead shall live, my dead body, they shall arise. So the reason resurrection is so thematic is because death reigned from Adam onward. And no, physical death is not in view there, but death through covenant. Covenant defines the terms. Biblical death is defined by the covenant. The reoccurring story is that through sin, through disobedience, by continually breaking their covenant oath, Israel had become all but dead to God. Hosea 13.1, when Ephraim spoke trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended through Baal worship, he died. Now they sin more and more. So here, Hosea, you know, this, this is a picture of a dead people. No, not physically dead, but dead in their offenses through their idolatry, through their trespasses and sins. You know, kind of like Ephesians chapter 2. This was their condition. They were unable to deliver themselves as a people. People. 
under the law. In fact, their sin increased. They needed resurrection life. This really is the same imagery that I think we see, like, for example, uh, with the dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37. A people who were dead, uh, a people experienced the curse of the covenant laid out by Moses and the prophets. They knew that they had been cut off, like in Ezekiel 37, for example. They knew they were all but dead to God. They needed God to breathe new life into them. They needed resurrection, not physical re resurrection. They needed new covenant life. They needed a covenant that would bring life because that old one didn't bring life. It actually brought death. Now, you know, I remember last Easter, the pastor referenced uh, Jesus dying for sins and his suffering and death was foretold in scripture. Well, that's true. And so he read 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which, was, which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, I thought this was kind of interesting because the pastor mentioned Isaiah chapter 53 as a reference to his dying for sins, according to the scripture. But when it came to the rising again of the third day, he didn't have anything to say about that. In fact, I think he kind of quickly skipped over that. And I think I thought to my second. Now, wait a minute. Paul says Christ was raised the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, so where in the world does it say that in the Old Testament scriptures? Where? Now, as far as I know, there's only one Old Testament passage that specifically mentions a third day. Do you know what that is? I've mentioned it a few times, I think, in the series. Hosea chapter 6, 1 and 2. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us. After two days, he will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Hmm. So this is what Paul cites to claim scripture teaches a rising of Jesus on a third day. That's kind of odd. See, do you, do you see all the plural and the collective us's and we's here? See, the idea here, it doesn't seem to be an individual resurrection of one man, namely Jesus, much less a physical resurrection. But from Hosea's perspective, I think this is kind of a collective rising of a people who are dead to God, but would be raised up into covenant life with God, with Messiah, beginning with the first fruits, his raising up in the last days. Do you see that? Israel collectively as a people is portrayed as torn up, like by, you know, as by a lion. They're left for dead but God, by God, but God is going to heal them collectively as a body of people. He's going to transform that old covenant people of the flesh into a new covenant people of the spirit. Yes, God would revive them and bring back life into them. God would raise them up collectively as a people, as a body. And folks, this took place during that New Testament transition period. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not discounting or dismissing the, you know, the individual aspect of resurrection. Sure, the new covenant body was formed one by one as each individual came to faith. But the body of Christ was raised. The people of God were being raised together in preparation for the wedding. Just around the corner. So we have number one examples of physically dead people coming alive again in both the Old Testament and the New Testament serving as a sign. Number two, we have individuals in the New Testament being spiritually or covenantly dead uh, or covenantly raised or resurrected into covenant life of God through faith. 
And number three, we have a resurrection of a new covenant people, a, a new covenant body beginning with Messiah, followed by individuals coming into that new covenant body being raised in him. All of these resurrection concepts, all of these resurrections were in process in the New Testament times. Now, however, but in addition to, and finally, we have resurrection concept number four. It would appear there was a resurrection of a different kind, a resurrection future to Paul that he was actually looking forward to. This resurrection seemed to be more of an event, from what I can read, more than of an event than a process. Paul said, Acts 24, 15, having hope towards God, which they them also selves wait for, there is about to be a rising of the dead, both of the righteous and unrighteous. Now, if your particular translation doesn't say there is about to be, that's because you're not seeing um, the, the Greek word mellow in there. In mellow, in the indicative, does mean imminence. It's on the cusp. It's about to happen. Uh, there was about to be a rising of the dead, and that's important. So Paul was waiting for the hope of resurrection just around the corner, and he was looking forward to it as he puts it in 1 Corinthians 15. There's that, that resurrection passage again, 1554. He was waiting for the corruptible putting on the incorruptible and the moral putting on immortality. And when it did, then he said, what would happen? Then it would be brought to pass the same that is written by Isaiah. Death is swallowed up in victory. So just on the horizon, death would be swallowed up in victory. Well, would you believe that when Paul wrote this, he was once again drawing on the prophets? Imagine that, okay? Where did he draw this death being swallowed up in victory from? Where did he get that from? Well, Isaiah chapter 25, verse eight. Again, Isaiah's little apocalypse. Hmm, a last day's passage that connects the resurrection with the destruction of the city and the temple with tribulation, a gathering, defeat of the serpent, a new Jerusalem city. Now, I believe that the resurrection that Paul was referring to in Acts 24 was the resurrection of the dead or the resurrection resurrection of the dead ones in the Hadean realm, or as, or the Old Testament name for it, Sheol. Sheol is sometimes translated grave, or hell, or pit, or place of sleep. Uh, it refers to the unseen realm, the underworld, the netherworld. Uh, it is uh, the abode of the dead. It's the place in which people descended at death, and it's the Greek equivalent uh, Hades that we see in the New Testament. So this is one of those things that I think is so quickly read over and, and probably glossed over, and we don't pay much attention to it. Uh, but just to give you a flavor of what I'm referring to. Listen to a few examples here. So Jacob, when he thought Joseph had been killed, all his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Yahweh kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and he brings up. Or in Psalms, we have, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Isaiah And Isaiah says, uh, You shall be brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. How about Job? Uh, shall it go down to, with me? Shall it go down with me to the gates of Sheol, or descend together into the dust. An Old Testament study of Sheol, along with what the New Testament writers say about it, it really should convince us that prior to the work of Christ on the cross and his coming, those under that covenant did not, could not actually enter heaven itself. Why? Well, because the work of redemption was not complete. 
Salvation had not been fully accomplished. Salvation had not been obtained. Redemption and salvation would not be completed until his second coming or his appearing for salvation. Israel was simply practicing. They were living in the shadow of salvation through their sacrificial system. Full, complete salvation would come when Christ would come uh, a second time apart for sin, from sin for salvation. Uh, this is what the first century believers were so eager for. They were eager for complete redemption and salvation. Um, it was right on the cusp. Um, finally, the long-awaited adoption as sons, like Romans chapter 8, adoption of sons or, or children of God, that was actually near to completion. That which was lost in Adam was actually being overcome then, and it was about to be fully, finally overcome. Romans 13, 11, and do this knowing the time, Paul says, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Hey, there's resurrection language. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Awake from sleep, why? Well, because completed salvation was near to them. Redemption was close. Speaking to his disciples in regards to the destruction of Jerusalem and their temple, in their generation, Jesus said this, Luke 21, 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your head. Why? Because your redemption draws near. 1 Peter 1, 5, speaking to the scattered Israelites, uh, he says, We who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, Jesus was a high priest. He was performing his priestly uh, role or duty. G but Jesus, see, he offered himself as the sacrifice. And then after that, instead of entering into, into you know, their earthly uh, temple in Jerusalem, Jesus actually entered into heaven itself and presented his blood upon the altar. That's what needed to be done, my friends. Hebrews 9.24, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, hmm, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear uh, in the presence of God for us. How about 9.28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. What for? For salvation. Folks, if Jesus hasn't come yet a second time apart from sin for sal salvation, you know what? Then those first century Jews under the Mosaic law, they ain't got it. And quite frankly, if you think you got it, you ain't got it, at least not in the sense that you think you can enter heaven. Why? Because salvation wouldn't be complete yet. Do you see that? But he did, and because of that, heaven itself is accessible. That's the point. Uh, and, and when he did, now this is important, when he did appear for that second time, or around that time, or about that time, I believe the dead, or the dead ones, were resurrected out of their waiting place Sheol, and into heaven itself. I mentioned John 5, 25, in reference to those coming alive in Christ's day during that time. That was the covenantal resurrection. They were coming alive. Uh, the time now was, according to Jesus. Well, I wonder if this, just a few verses later, uh, is a reference to all those in Sheol awaiting the resurrection. John 5, 28 and 29. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Again, that sure sounds like Daniel 12 too, doesn't it? Now you probably recall in John chapter 3, uh, when Jesus had a conversation with Nicodemus. John 3, 13, Jesus said this, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in 
heaven. Okay. Now look, there's a lot of opinions on this, uh, but I think, in my opinion, Jesus is basically saying that, you know, nobody up to that point, no one had ascended into heaven itself. That is, nobody except who? Well, except him, because he had descended from heaven. Now, Jesus called himself the true bread from heaven. He said in John 6, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In fact, he plainly said in verse 38, For I have come down from heaven. So he, Jesus, Messiah, came into that covenant world to bring life to those in bondage to that covenant. Life and immortality was in the Son. John 5 1 Timothy 6. Thus, the life that he offered was available or was in the covenant that he offered. So here's a loose paraphrase of what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. He's saying, hey, look, Nick, buddy old pal, I came down out of heaven because you've got a problem, my friend. You can't go up. Not until I finish my redemptive work. You want to go up? You want to enter into the heavenly kingdom? Uh, then you're going to have to be born again because the corruptible, the mortal, uh, the, the natural, flesh and blood cannot enter in. You're earthy, buddy, but you got to be heavenly. <laughs> um, that being the case, you're going to have to be adopted by God as a son, which means you're going to have to be born from above. Right now, Adam is your daddy, but you need Yahweh is your daddy. Uh, you're going to have to put on Messiah. You're going to have to put on Christ, immortality, in order to bear the image of God as a son. Um, because right now you bear the, the image of your father, Adam. So you were born, Nick, into this, this, uh, this covenant uh, of Moses, into this covenant world of Moses, that is, through physical birth. But that covenant only condemns and brings death. You're going to have to experience another birth through another covenant. This new covenant that I bring, it pertains to the the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly. So just like I created a people bringing them out of Egypt, now I'm creating a new people, Nick, via a new exodus. And I'm transforming my people. I'm bringing them out of the darkness, the death, and the bondage of this covenant. Those who are willing to come anyway. Are you willing, Nick? <laughs> Anyway, that's my paraphrase. So look, this process of resurrection, this took place during that transformation period between covenants. Messiah, through his death, through his burial, resurrection, ascension, he began the resurrection process of raising up a new body as people started pressing into the kingdom of God in the last days. That's what's going on. And I believe that this resurrection process came to its completion with the resurrection of the dead ones out of Sheol into heaven itself. Bottom line, the resurrection of Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, those events and that event occurred at that time just after the tribulation of those days as we see in verse 1. Next lesson, we are going to wrap up Daniel chapter 12. I promise you that. And then we're going to move on to the minor prophets. All right. Thanks for sticking with me if you did. Um, we'll see you next round. Take care, everybody. Adios.